The 82 game preseason is in the books and now it's finally time for the real season. Don't miss out on any of the NBA playoff action at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. From the play-in tournament through the finals, DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered with same game parlays, live betting, odds boosts, and so much more. The Boston Celtics are currently the favorite at plus 160, but the the team that's third in my championship rankings, the Dallas Mavericks, you can get them on DraftKings right now at plus 1,600 to win the title. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code HOOPS. That's H-O-O-P-S. New customers bet $5 and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's code HOOPS, H-O-O-P-S, only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. All right, welcome to Hoops Tonight here at The Volume. Happy Tuesday, everybody. Hope all of you guys are having a great week so far. We're going to be breaking down the Warriors dynasty, potentially ending at the hands of the Sacramento Kings in the play-in game, the 9-10 play-in game. For those of you guys looking for a breakdown of Lakers-Pelicans, we actually already recorded that. It's already uploaded, so you can find that a little bit further back in the feed. Just going to talk a little bit of Kings off the top. Uh, I don't really view them as a threat after this point. They're 0-5 versus the Pelicans of this year. Obviously, Zion being out potentially with the hamstring is going to be somewhat of an issue, but it's more of the Pelicans perimeter players that give them a bother. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the Warriors, some of the things that stood out from this season, and uh, part of the reason why I was never really optimistic about them making a run to begin with, where the Warriors should go from here. And then at the end, I personally just want to pay a, a little bit of a – homage to the Warriors just for what it was like rooting, uh, uh, obviously as someone who's a fan of LeBron James and had to root against them a lot over the years, just how, how incredible that dynasty was, how, you know, relentless they were in their pursuit of winning and how inevitable they felt at times. And some, I put down four of my favorite moments after the, after KD left and just kind of like my just kind of my appreciation for the Warriors. That's going to be at the end of the show. You guys know the drill before we get started. Subscribe to our brand new YouTube channel so you don't miss any more of our videos. Follow me on Twitter at underscore Jason LT so you guys don't miss show announcements. As well as the film threads that I do from time. Don't forget about our podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts under Hoops Tonight. It's also super helpful if you leave, leave a rating and a review on that front. And the last but not least, keep leaving mailbag questions in the YouTube comments so we can keep hitting them throughout the rest of this week. All right, let's talk some basketball. So this was just a complete and total beatdown at the hands of the Sa uh, Sacramento Kings. They outshot the Warriors from the field. They outshot the Warriors from three. They shot better from the foul line. They doubled them up on the offensive glass. They had more assists with fewer turnovers. They had twice as many steals, twice as many fast break points, and committed fewer fouls. It was just a complete and total outclassing. Honestly, I was a little disappointed just with how the Warriors held up physically because for all of the the weaknesses that the Warriors have, things like interior size, things like shot creation, one of their strengths is they're actually a really athletic team, especially on the wing. They've got a lot of youthful exuberance at some key positions and a lot of length and athleticism, especially on the perimeter. That should, in theory allow them to match up pretty well with Sacramento, but they just they, they just didn't hold up tonight for whatever reason. I, obviously, the, the veterans in particular struggled in this game, but some of the young guys too, uh, even though their effort shined through, some of their execution stuff that you expect from young players to struggle with, that kind of shined through to the surface as well. It was just a complete and total dominating performance from the Sacramento Kings. I want to shout out two specific guys. First is Keegan Murray. He literally looked like the old Clay Thompson out there. He was defending a quick guard extremely well, right? We've we've seen uh, uh, Clay do that to a bunch of quick guards over the year, namely Kyrie Irving, uh, over the course of their matchups in the playoffs over the years, and hidden threes, not just in volume, not in different spots on the floor, but also just flying off of screens, kind of like we're accustomed to seeing from Clay Thompson. Uh, honestly, uh, Keegan hit eight threes in this game. Honestly, like I have to kind of eat a little bit of crow here in the sense that, like, when Keegan Murray got drafted and after watching him play in the NBA last year, I was, you know, 
uh, appreciative of him as a good role player in this league, but I didn't really think he had this kind of upside as a perimeter defender. I didn't think he had this kind of upside as a movement shooter. I, I have to kind of reevaluate my personal kind of like view of Keegan Murray ceiling with some of the stuff that he's shown this season. And this was just a big time performance from him in a super, super important game. Honestly, like for all the, the criticism of the play in tournament that we've seen over the years, that was an intense game. You, you had two really good teams playing in a single elimination game. You just don't get that in the NBA very often. Typically, the 9-10 game, even in the Western Conference over the years, has been the lesser of the teams that we've seen. It's usually the 7-8 game where we'll see the good teams. And some of this is just the realities of the Western Conference. There are 10 good teams in the West, right? Like, I'll give you guys an example. I think the Lakers and Clippers are both clearly top six teams in the NBA. I had the Lakers at six in my contender rankings and I had the Clippers at four, if I remember correctly. So like Lakers and Clippers for me, both top six championship contenders, I'm going to be picking them both to lose in the first round of the playoffs. Why? Because they're playing teams, two teams that are in the top three of my championship contenders. The Western conference is just completely stacked. And so unfortunately, as a product of that, the Warriors and Kings fall down into the nine, 10 game. They have to play a single elimination game. Somebody has got to go home and ends up being, the Golden State Warriors, but shout out to Keegan Murray because in such a big game for him to show up the way he did, uh, that tells you a lot about the type of potential that he has in the big picture. Keon Ellis is the second guy. You guys who remember last year in the postseason, I talked a lot about how De'Aaron Fox and Malik Monk to a certain extent, but De'Aaron Fox mainly demonstrated that like he could really defend the guard position. He's capable of it. It's just a lot to ask for your primary shot creating star to defend the other team's best guard, right? And so you'd see a lot of like Davion Mitchell, but Davion Mitchell had some offensive limitations and they just didn't have an option that they could go to that they could consistently get high quality perimeter defense while also getting the ability to consistently knock down an open shot while also not having to ask De'Aaron Fox to do it. Because if you have to ask De'Aaron Fox to do it, you're, you're paying the price on the other end of the floor. Keon Ellis has been that for the Kings this year. He can really, really defend the best guards in the league while also being a knockdown shooter and also take that off of De'Aaron Fox's workload. And I I thought, you know, Mike Brown actually talked about it after the third quarter in his interview, basically just talking about like, hey, like being able to switch things up on Steph and go from length and size to kind of like speed and quickness with Keon Ellis, it was a way that they could kind of keep Steph off balance. And I thought he did a really nice job. And as I've talked about all season long, With the Warriors, if you can do a good job on Steph, you're probably going to win because there's nobody else on that team that can consistently generate high-quality shots. They held Steph to 22 points. They forced him into six turnovers. Then they dominated every other facet of the game and got the win. Here's the problem. Sacramento is a team that just brings perimeter defender after perimeter defender after perimeter defender after perimeter defender. De'Aaron Fox is going to be seeing Herb Jones. He's going to be seeing Dyson Daniels. He's going to be seeing length and athleticism on him for the entire game. And they just have a, a plethora of that type of talent on the floor. And they get, they press the, uh, they press the ball handlers. They play passing lanes. They force turnovers. They get out in transition. They're uh, five and zero against the Sacramento Kings this year. And again, Zion Williamson pulled his hamstring at the end of the Lakers game tonight. So maybe that'll give them a little bit of a semblance of a route that they can go. But the Pelicans, you know, when they take Zion out, they play a little bit more drive and kick, but they can still be actually better defensively than they are with Zion on the floor. Obviously, they're just going to kind of default more to running things through Brandon Ingram and CJ McCollum, but I still think the Pelicans are going to get that win on Friday just on the strength of their perimeter defense. Either way, though, I don't think either of those teams have much of a chance against Oklahoma City, even if they're better matchups. Uh, than some of the other teams in the West that they can face. So really impressive win for the the Kings, but without Malik Monk, uh, even if they do survive the Pelicans game, I don't think they have the horses to make any sort of substantial playoff run. So moving on to the Warriors, there's going to be a lot of talk uh, about Draymond Green and the way his suspension kind of put them in this predicament. I think they were 33 and 22 this year when Draymond actually played, which is pretty solid, right? And I want to be clear, there's truth to that. Like Draymond Green did put his team in a predicament where they dropped a bunch of games and maybe just maybe they're not in the nine, 10 game. If Draymond plays the entire season, however, I never really saw the Warriors as a team that was capable of 
winning multiple playoff rounds. Maybe just maybe if they got like the Thunder in the first round, a really young team, or uh, or maybe like the Minnesota Timberwolves who can struggle to execute in half court, like maybe the Warriors could get a playoff round underneath their belt. But I didn't view them as a, a substantial threat in the West this year. And the main reason why was they weren't very good against the good teams in the league. Like this season, they were 23 and four against teams in the bottom 10 in point differential, which was the seventh best mark in the league. But they were just nine and 21 versus teams that are in the top 10 in point differential this year. That's 20th in the NBA. They consistently, when they ran up against the real teams at the top of the league, they just didn't have the shot creation. And that was really it. And it, and it, and some of it, it kind of comes down to, to two things. First of all, the team's fatal flaw. They didn't have another guy on the roster who could consistently generate high quality offense. Like Kaminga had a hot stretch, you know, you get a hot stretch at Andrew Wiggins at some point, you get a hot stretch out of Clay Thompson at some point, uh, at some point. But in any one game sample, when you were going in as a Warriors fan or going in as, as someone who watches the Warriors a lot, you were sitting there thinking like, is Clay going to play well tonight? Maybe. Is Andrew Wiggins going to play well tonight? Maybe. Is Jonathan Kaminga going to play well tonight? Maybe. There wasn't a legit guy next to Steph that you could depend on to consistently generate high quality offense. Basically, everybody in the Western Conference has that. Sacramento before the Malik Monk injury, you knew you had that with Malik Monk. Obviously, LeBron James, it's kind of by committee by committee with AD, Austin Reeves, and D'Angelo Russell, right? Obviously, the New Orleans Pelicans, it's Brandon Ingram, Zion uh, Williamson, and it's CJ McCollum, right? You go to the the Suns, it's KD, Bradley Beal, Devin Booker. You go to the Clippers, it's James Harden, it's Kevin uh, or it's uh, Kawhi Leonard, it's Paul George, it's Luka Doncic, and it's Kyrie Irving, it's Jamal Murray, and it's Nikola Jokic. The Warriors, really, aside from the the injury to Malik Monk, they were the only team in the Western Conference that did not have a legitimate threat that could consistently generate quality shots beyond Steph Curry. And then to make make matters worse. Steph just hasn't been the same player over the course of the last third of the season. And this kind of really colors things when we start to talk about where the Warriors should go from here. Steph's 25 games to end the season. 22.8 points per game. 4.5 rebounds per game. 5.5 assists per game. 41.9% from the field. 37.5% from three. That's Steph's last 25 games of the season. And then you saw him tonight really struggling to break free from Keegan and Murray and to break free from Keon Ellis. A lot of sloppy turnovers, a lot of like just struggling to kind of get to his spots, right? And so there's a bunch of factors there. My guess is he's probably a little banged up. Wouldn't be surprised if in the next couple of days we hear some sort of report of an injury that Steph Curry's been dealing with. Because like even in decline, and we're going to talk about that, even in decline shouldn't happen this dramatically this quickly, right? Two, yeah, Steph getting a little older, small guard, there's going to be some decline there. You're starting to see that. And then three, when you don't have legitimate, uh, reliable shot creation off of your star, it allows teams to throw the kitchen sink at Steph Curry. By the way, this is a big part of why I'm not as high on the New York Knicks as everyone else. Love the New York Knicks in the long run. But without Julius Randle, they do not have a legitimate secondary shot creator next to Jalen Brunson. As a result, they're 7-17 seven and 17 this year. Against teams that are in the top 10 in point differential, I do not think they're going to be able to beat the teams with the high firepower for the exact same reason. For the exact same reason. When you have one guy, you can throw the kitchen sink at it, and chances are you'll figure out a way to rotate on the back end to to kind of contain some of those more limited offensive players. And, and so, like, that's just that's that's really where things fell apart for the Warriors this year. Honestly, like. You know, and I talked about this during Jonathan Kaminga's rise. We had that stretch there. Like, Jonathan Kaminga had never had two consecutive 20-point games in his career. And then he rips off eight of them in a row, right? And you're like, holy shit, this guy might be a future star. By the way, I still kind of feel like he's going to be. I don't think he's on the trajectory with, like, Anthony Edwards and, like, the super, super stars that we have that are the young players in the league. But, like... I think he could be kind of in that Jalen Brown level guy that's in the 15 to 20th best player in the league who's like a legit 25 point per game guy who can really defend. I think that's in Kaminga's potential, right? And so he flashed all that potential and then all of a sudden training guys, trading guys was just out of the window, right? Like going into that stretch, you're like, 
trade Kaminga, trade some draft picks. Maybe you go after Pascal Siakam. Maybe you go after an OG Ananobi. And then as Kaminga started to play better, right as OG Ananobi and Pascal Siakam were off, uh, uh, were the trade talks were heating up, they go off, uh, uh, Kaminga uh, playing well kind of removes him from that equation. All of a sudden, they're out of the Siakam, OG Ananobi sweepstakes. Now, all of a sudden, you're kind of trapped with this particular group, right? And I talked consistently during that time. You Warriors fans that follow the show, you'll remember this. I said consistently during that time, like, this is great for the future, but do not count on these young guys to be reliable shot creators when you get to big-time playoff games. And that, that's what this was. This was a big-time playoff game. And Kaminga made some plays tonight. Played really hard. I thought he had a good stretch there in the first half. But, like, he wasn't... Was he consistently generating quality shots in this game? No, because he's young. He's too young for that type of game. And he's not polished enough as, with his handle and to get to his spots and to read the floor to do that. Will he in five years? Probably. I think that's on the table. Not just on the table. It's probably likely for Jonathan Kaminga in a five-year timeline. But the minute you decided... We're not going all in. We're sticking with these guys. You capped off this team. And the championship ceiling was out the window. Uh, I, I mean, I, th I threw them 10th uh, tied with the Heat in my contender rankings just as a no like basically a, a sign of respect towards Steph Curry and Jimmy Butler. But, you know, the Warriors just don't have the firepower. They don't have the firepower to hang in these types of games. Un like, they could have beat the Kings tonight. I'm not trying to act like they can't beat the Kings. Of course they could beat the Kings tonight. They needed to hold up better physically. They needed more out of Clay, and they needed Steph to play like a superstar. Instead, they didn't hold up physically. Clay gave you nothing, and Steph played like he's been playing for the last third of the season. And as a result, they got basically dog-walked tonight, right? And so, like, that that's, that's kind of the reality of the predicament that they're in. And so, you know... You could, where do we go from here? You could make an all in trade, right? Like you could try to go after a star, maybe a Paul George, maybe a Brandon Ingram if the Pelicans decide to kind of change their build this summer. You can go in that sort of direction, but you have to take a look at your situation here. Like Steph slash 25 games, how much of that is decline versus not playing alongside a star? You take a gamble. You go after a star. Let's say you get Paul George. But you have to give up Kaminga. You have to give up draft compensation. Let let's say Steph just is isn't a top ten player next year. If that happens, then all of a sudden now you don't have the draft assets and the young talent to kind of sh slide into the next phase of your future. You just have an old Steph and an old Paul George, right? And so that's where it gets tricky. Like I almost feel like if you were going to do that, you needed to do it last year. You needed to do it. The year after they won the title. That was the year where it made sense. Steph was still playing at that level. A lot of those guys, the, the young guys, were mostly just kind of, uh, you know, just prospects at that point. They didn't have that sort of long-term potential. That, or at least we hadn't seen it really manifest for Jonathan Kaminga yet. That was where it made sense to do it. Now it doesn't really make a lot of sense. And, like, who were the guys that kind of came in and brought the energy tonight when the Warriors came out flat? It was Moses Moody. It was Brandon Podziemski. It was... Jonathan Kaminga, right? And and it's because they have the athletic tools to kind of hang in those sorts of settings, right? So, like, I think, honestly, like, if I was running the Warriors at this point, I would just kind of read the writing on the wall. Like, if you can work out some sort of team-friendly deal for Clay and he wants to stay because he likes his living situation and he likes this team, you you, you work it out. But if he gets offered a, a, a chunk of money and he wants to go, you let him go. You know, you you see if you can make some moves on the margin uh, margins. I don't know if you can use a draft pick and and maybe one of the younger players or or maybe using Chris Paul's salary to try to bring in some sort of uh, of piece to kind of bring in some firepower. But I don't think you mortgage the future anymore for this group. I think what you do is 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 you bring obviously Steph and Draymond back. You bring a legitimate center in so that you can play a center next to Draymond to give yourself a better chance of holding up in terms of size, and then you lean into the youth next year. I think you probably start, you know, either Moses Moody and Jonathan Kaminga or Andrew Wiggins and Jonathan Kaminga. You lean heavily into Jonathan Kaminga as a shot creator and and try to get him to build that out. And you don't worry as much about where you're at in the standings. You just work on development and work towards the future. But like, again, like, I, I, think, I, I think the reality is, is that the championship ceiling is gone with this group. The, the championship ceiling with this group was Steph is a top five player. 
You make a trade to bring in a legitimate secondary star. They never did that. Now Steph has declined. Now the young guys are coming up. That's the direction you have to look to go from here. And and, and I guess, honestly, it's going to be about whether or not Steph uh, is willing to kind of be a part of a soft rebuild like that. My guess is Steph loves it in Golden State so much and that he's so integral to that franchise that he's not going anywhere. And to be honest, as much as I'd love to see Steph compete for a championship again someday, I just can't even fathom seeing him in another jersey. And so I think more likely than not uh, that he he ends up kind of just kind of riding off into the sunset gracefully as a member of the Golden State Warriors during a soft rebuild. But the only way a championship ceiling is coming back is if Jonathan Kaminga takes a five-year leap over the summer. And, and I just, and I just don't really uh, see that as a, as a, as an option. And, or maybe they can, you know, nail some stuff over the course of the summer to kind of polish some things up on the roster. But the reality is it's a firepower issue with this team. They just never had consistently that secondary option next to Steph. So uh, before we get out of here tonight, I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the Warriors dynasty from just purely from a fan perspective. So as I've told you guys before, I am a LeBron James fan. And obviously now it's it's much more of like a grown up fanhood, right? Like I'm LeBron fans hate me because I'm critical of him when he doesn't play well because <laughs> I do a job to cover the NBA and talk about you know these these basketball games and actually give X's and O's analysis, right? Um, uh, so like obviously at this phase of my career it's different, but like you know when I was during the Warriors dynasty, like I was in my mid twenties and I was you know, uh, like a young emotional fan who loved LeBron, loved that Cavaliers team. And I had to root against the Warriors and man, did that suck? <laughs> you know, like not just, not even just the KD years. Cause the KD years were all about, you know, second and third best player in the, in the world teaming up and the, like the uh, Cavs just never really had a chance, but like going back to the 2015 year watching Steph, light up Matthew Della Vadova in game five, I thought Steph got absolutely robbed of the finals MVP that year. All you had to do is have a basic understanding of the way the game of basketball works to understand that he was the reason everything was working for the Warriors down the stretch of that series, but it is what it is. Obviously the 2016 year, it's a little bit of Steph being heard. It's a little bit of uh, LeBron James and Kyrie Irving just meeting an insane level. But I have four moments after KD left the Warriors well, actually, one of them's uh, without KD, but in his last season with the Warriors, that just kind of, to me, encapsulated what made this Warriors dynasty so great. First was the 2019 series, the series against the Toronto Raptors. So obviously, Kevin Durant goes down with the calf injury in the second round, and Golden State ends up sweeping the Portland Trailblazers without Kevin Durant and come back from huge deficits in all four games. Just a reminder of just how good Steph Clay and Draymond were when they were at their best. Like KD made them unbeatable, but even without KD, they were still a top tier contender in the league. They just probably wouldn't have, you know, they, they probably get one of those two instead of two of those two, right? Like that's what I always say is like, I think if KD doesn't go to golden state, LeBron gets one of them in 2017, 2018, and Steph gets one of them in 2017, 2018. Instead, KD went there, so they got them both, right? But like, I think a lot of times we use the KD stuff to kind of underplay just how good Steph Clay and Draymond were. And like that game five, the game, uh, was it game five? Yeah, it was game five, uh, where Kawhi Leonard just went on that crazy haymaker spree to, uh, to, to get, I think the, I think the Raptors went up by like six at that point in the game. And then Stephen Clay just stole that game with shot making. And I remember sitting there thinking like, these dudes are just winners, man. Like KD literally tore his Achilles in that game. If I remember correctly, I, I believe it was that game. KD hurts himself. You're on the ropes. Kawhi's on a shot making spree. It all looks like it's over. You're on the road. And Stephen Clay just refused to lose. And they got it done. And even then, I, if I remember correctly, in game six, Steph had a little step back jump shot on the right wing that could have tied it. So like they just they just didn't go down without a fight. I thought that was a, a great example of the winning character of the Warriors. 2021 play in game. Obviously you have no Clay Thompson in that game. If I remember correctly, uh um I think that Andrew Wiggins was on that team. But once again, like the that that was the Lakers when they still had all their athleticism, right? That was when they still had Alex Caruso and they still had Contavious Caldwell Pope. Like that was a very, very good Lakers team. And Steph just played absurdly well and and literally pushed them to the brink. And then LeBron basically hit the game winner 
uh, when he got poked in the eye. But like, there's a moment in that game, and you Warriors fans will probably remember this. You Lakers fans will definitely remember this. But there was a moment in that game where the Lakers went on a little run in the fourth quarter, and the camera pans over to Steph on the sideline. And after the Lakers made their run, because Steph obviously sits to start the fourth quarter, you just see this this moment where Steph just kind of nods and he just goes like, all right, let's go. We got ourselves a game here. And I remember watching it being like, this motherfucker is going to check back into the game and immediately reassert himself. And he checked back in the game and the Warriors immediately regained control. And like that stretch there, that 2021, 2022, 2023 stretch from Steph was so much fun because I actually think that was the best version of Steph. I know a lot of Steph fans disagree with me, but I just thought he was at such a level defensively. A lot of times people forget like around 2016 when Steph won the unanimous MVP, Steph was barbecuing traditional coverages. And a lot of teams just didn't know how to handle Steph yet. As a matter of fact, the the Cavs blitzing him in the in the 2015 finals, that was kind of like the first team that really that really started doing that and doing it effectively like they did in that series, although Steph ended up solving it. Like the idea of the way you guard Steph Curry didn't really come to fruition until the end of the 2010s. And like Steph was barbecuing the best defensive coverages to to deal with a player like him in that 2021, 2022, 2023 stretch. I just thought he was at an insanely high level. Obviously, the 2022 playoff run. What's crazy with that one is like Steph's a, a rhythm player, uh, like, like every other uh, uh, kind of like perimeter shooter in the league, right? And he went into that playoff run on a foot injury and came off the bench to start the Denver series. And then ended up with one of the best playoff games I've ever seen from an individual player in that game four in Boston, just kind of backpacking the Warriors on their way to the title. And like, it was like, it, it was similar to like the Denver Nuggets in the sense that like there wasn't like a bona fide superstar next to Steph, but he was getting a lot of big time contributions from big time players, right? Like, like obviously, uh, Clay Thompson did an unbelievable job defensively in that series on Jalen Brown. You got the, uh, um, uh, Jordan Poole playoff run. You get the Andrew Wiggins playoff run. Like they, they got some contributions. Again, no team wins a championship without help. But Steph was just unbelievable in that playoff run. And then 2023, 50 points in game seven on the road against the Sacramento Kings. And then in that 2023 second round playoff series, watching that chess match between Steve Kerr and Darvin Ham surrounding the Anthony Davis, Steph Curry problem for both teams. And I, I, you know, it's funny this summer, I went back and I rewatched that series. And those of you guys who actually watched the show over the summer, you probably remember me doing a show about this, but like Steph, no matter what the Lakers threw at him in that series, Steph just controlled things in ball screens. It was crazy. I can't remember the exact numbers because I pulled him over the summer, but the Lakers were throwing the kitchen sink at him. And he just continued to get and generate quality shots every single time down the floor, no matter what coverage they used. It, really, the only the only reason the Lakers escaped that series was at the end of game four, Lonnie Walker hit a bunch of pull-up jump shots, and then Anthony Davis switched onto Steph Curry, which was the ultimate kind of like final move that, that the Lakers had in their back pocket and Anthony Davis got a couple of stops on an Island and that was pretty much it. But like that entire series, I can just tell you as a fan, as someone who was rooting against Steph and rooting for LeBron in that series, like I felt helpless. And, and, it, and again, it just, that's what I remember about the golden state dynasty is like when they were healthy, when Steph was at his a game, when Clay and Draymond were out there, when they had a legitimate two way wing, whether it was Wiggins, whether it was Barnes, whether it was Kevin Durant, they were just inevitable. They were the best team of that particular era, in my opinion. And uh, if this ends up being it, and I, I still think the Warriors will be interesting over the course of the next few years, just because they've got some young talent. They got a great home crowd and they do have Steph Curry. And I still think Steph Curry's, you know, top 15, top 10 player in the league. Right. So like there's going to be some fun times over the next few years, but salute to those guys. It's been a hell of a run. It's been a decade of dominance four championships got close uh, 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 in 2019 and 2016 as well. One of the great teams in NBA history, and it's been an honor to get to cover them and to get to watch them as a fan. And, you know, that, that's kind of why I talk, you know, how excited I am about the Nuggets. They feel to me like the next great team, the next great dynasty of this era. All right. That's all I have for tonight. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. I'll be back tomorrow morning. 
to uh well tomorrow morning i'm going to start my prep we'll see when i actually get it uploaded but i'm going to start with a series preview of lakers nuggets and then we'll do a series preview of the eastern conference uh seven two matchup probably on thursday and then we'll see I, i'm trying to think of what we're going to do on friday probably gonna have the nerd sesh guys on and then obviously on saturday morning we'll have the one eight matchup previews and then we'll get into our playoff grind and so uh we're here man this is it night one of the playoffs in the books i appreciate you guys i will see you tomorrow